Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt, where we read better, not more. Today we are continuing our discussion of the Odyssey. In my previous video, I talked about Homer and the differences between the Iliad and the Odyssey. But today, I want to talk about two Greek ideas, which I will say in a less snobby way than last time, Homo Sophrune and the Oikos. And yes, once again, I am pre-filming and I'm wearing exactly the same outfit as I wore in my previous video. I'm going to call myself out every single time. Also, what is up with these doodlies? Let's fix that. Okay. Homo sophrune. So let's start with that concept. It roughly translates as same soul, having the same soul. And this is a huge motivation for Odysseus. He is longing for a companion who has the same soul as him. His soulmate. Ah. So let's take a step back and take a look at the mythical context for Odysseus. As we mentioned in the mythical context video for the Iliad, there was an oath made between all of the suitors of Helen that they would band together and fight if she were ever stolen away. This idea actually came from Odysseus who presented it himself but asked not to be selected because he had his eye on another woman, Penelope, who is actually Helen's cousin or something like that. And when the day finally came for the oath to be fulfilled, how motivated is Odysseus to participate? Not very. Not very motivated. He pretends to be half crazy and half stupid to get out of it. He takes an ox and a donkey to plow a field and he drives all over the place in these crazy lines and sows salt in his field. The ox and the donkey is significant because they have like different gates and different paces so you would never hitch them up together. So Menelaus puts the infant Telemachus, his firstborn, only born son, in the path of the plow. And when Odysseus turns to avoid him, they sort of are like, ha, you're pretending to be crazy. You do have your right mind and now you, you can't get out of it. Now, Odysseus seems to be motivated by glory and battle as much as the next Greek hero in the Iliad, but for Odysseus, it was prophesied that he would have a long journey home, so he knew he wouldn't merely be gone for the war if he went. Here we see Odysseus as the family man, the faithful husband and loving father. He wasn't interested in the most beautiful woman in the world. He was interested in Penelope. Why? Because she matched him in intelligence and wisdom. She is his homo sophrone. This is why even when Odysseus is the lover of Circe, he wants to go home. Even when he's the lover of Calypso, who also wants to make him into a mortal so he can stay with her forever, he doesn't even want immortality. He wants to go home. Even when he catches the eye of the princess of the magical and superior Phycaeans, he wants to go home. Odysseus isn't looking to become a god or the plaything of the gods. He knows he is a man and he wants to live among his equals. Maybe this is a lesson he has learned on the battlefield of Troy, where men were led by gods to glory but also to death. The idea that Odysseus as a family man is, is part of the conservative ethics of the Greeks. They believed that there was sort of like a right way to live your life and following this ethical path was increasingly important the more power and influence you had. The role of a wife was to be modest. This is emblemized by the idea that she is sitting at home with the distaff preparing wool to be woven. It's this idea that she's contributing economically to the home while also fulfilling the, wife, uh, the role of wife and mother and is being modest, chaste. There was also this sense that you could judge the quality of a man by how well he kept his oikos, or his home. We get our word economy from this Greek word, by the way. So for Odysseus, we know that he was a good father and landlord and king, that he ran his household well, because even 20 years later, the suitors still have wine and pigs and sheep to eat and consume. The wealth and prosperity of this household is a centerpiece to their selfishness, but also a clue as to how we are supposed to understand Odysseus as king and father. I also want to talk a little bit about tree imagery and how it relates here. The idea of the strength of the oikos is represented variously with trees throughout the narrative. So throughout his travels, the narrator will note that a grove of trees outside of a strange and unknown place, and I wonder if these might be clues as to worth interpreting, that they might give insight into the type of person who lives there. For example, the Cyclops' island is described as having black poplars, so too is Persephone's grove in the underworld populated with black pop poplars and fruit-perishing willows. 
Charybdis has a fig tree right outside of its like whole thing and so forth. The most important tree that comes up is almost as an aside. It grows through the bedchamber of Odysseus and Penelope and is one of the legs to their bed. So their bed is sort of like constructed has three other legs, but one of the legs is this tree, and this tree grows up through a hole in their, I'm presuming, a hole in the roof of their home, right? And so here the symbolism is quite clear, right? We have this firm foundation of their family, their family tree or their progeny, the solid construction of the oikos. This imagery is also extended through the pillar that supports the roof. This pillar is referenced many times throughout the narrative as we see it on Ithaca. And almost every time Penelope actually comes down to the main room where the suitors are like carousing, she stands by this pillar, right? And this seems symbolic in a couple of ways. One, she supports the oikos. She does so by performing her proper role. In fact, the first time she does this, she's giving a speech in defense of her modesty, and Athena in that moment sort of blesses her with beauty and grace. It's also emblematic of the fact that she's remaining faithful to Odysseus, that original tree, that original line of the family, even if she doesn't know whether or not he's alive. And by extension, she's remaining faithful to the descendants of the house of Odysseus in the sense of his son fulfilling this role and taking his inheritance and supporting that natural uh, inheritance. We also see that in the ultimate fight between Odysseus and the suitors, the spear throws of the suitors miss Odysseus. Instead, they hit this very same pillar, but the pillar stands strong and supports the roof and the structure of the house. Very symbolic here. The, Odysseus is, or the suitors are trying to attack the natural succession of this home. Here again, the imagery is not difficult to parse out. The suitors are not wrong because they are courting Penelope, but because they are attacking Odysseus's very household and trying to destroy it. But more on that on another day. So that's all that I have for you today. What do you think of Odysseus's travels home and his motivations? What do you think of the Greek concept of the oikos and my interpretation of the trees throughout? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below. In my next video, we're going to take a look at Odysseus's major flaw and the essential evil that the suitors commit and why they're so deserving of this sort of like bloodbath and ultimate death. Until next time, I'm Alexandra, and I'm still a bibliophile.